Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion at Doma Palooza today. I am Michelle Getz, uh, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, covering everything from artificial intelligence to uh, data management architecture and strategy. And um, today we're here to talk about the future of data science and automated machine learning. I've got some great guests on our panel. We've got Sean Thompson, um, IT Director of Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers, Bob House, Head of uh, Worldwide Machine Learning Service Specialist Team at AWS. And of course, we have Christy J. Rowley, uh, PhD and Principal Data Scientist Man and Manager of Data Science Professional Services at Domo. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you guys and let you uh, introduce yourself a little bit further and, and maybe, you know, answer the question like, what are you seeing as the biggest misconception around data science today? Sean, do you want to take it out? Yeah, I'll get us started. So I'm Sean Thompson, like she said, uh, IT director over here at Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers. Um, we're a, you know, rest a quick service restaurant chain. We've got about 400 locations here in the U.S. And, um, you know, I, I see two kind of competing misconceptions all the time in data science. One, that there's not enough data and you can't derive any kind of real insight from it because, you know, there's just too much out there to know or that data is going to answer all of the questions that are possibly ever could know. And, you know, we can predict sales down to a location, down to the penny, you know, two quarters out. Um, but of course, you know, the answer is right there in the middle, right? There's enough data to get great insight, but not enough data to be able to tell you when, I don't know, the next pandemic is going to hit or something like that that can throw all the data out the window. Fantastic. Thank you. And Bob, would you like to take it next? Morning, folks. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Moss. I'm with Amazon Web Services. I run a business development team on a worldwide basis that's folks on helping our customers adopt machine learning. Um, you know, to, to follow on um, with what Sean said, when, when we look at our customers, there's a couple high level misperceptions. One is that we have to go out and hire a whole bunch of like machine learning PhD scientists. And you start looking at the state of the art and how things are evolving. There's a lot of machine learning services, products, you know, solutions, I'll, I'll use the Amazon term services, um, that are really enabling citizen data scientists and people to do auto ML. And so that, that's one of the things. The other thing is we have customers, and we can dive into that first topic more later, but we have customers that come to us say, I have a whole bunch of data and I know machine learning is important, so I'm ready to get started. Um, and, and that's where a lot of times we have to work with our customers. And, and take them on that journey that it's not quite simple that I have a bunch of data and I think machine learning is important. There's a little bit more to it than, than just that, um, but you definitely don't need a hundred uh, machine learning scientists either. That's fantastic. And hey, Christy, how are you doing today? You wanna to introduce yourself and maybe give us a perspective from the Domo side on you know, what, what do people get right and what do people really need to kind of rethink when they get to um, to data science? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Christy Rowley, as Michelle mentioned, I'm Domo's principal data scientist. I manage our data science professional services team here at Domo. Um, we love working with our customers and it's fun to see uh, how customer knowledge around data science grows and how their interest in data science has grown over the past couple of years as Domo has really embraced data science. A couple of the misconceptions that I've seen, um, one, one is my favorite, um, that data science will actually make your data better. Uh, we, we can do magic <laughs> things with data. We can do a lot of things with data, but uh, generally it's the other way around. Uh, data science depends on high quality data to get high quality models, to get high quality data science, you have to have high quality data already. So one of the things that we do at Demo, anytime we set up a data science initiative with a customer is build up that data pipeline so that you're getting really high quality data all the time. And Demo, of course, is built around automation. So we care about getting that data and making sure that the fidelity of the data is maintained all the time in your data pipeline, actually built right into the process and right, right into the production process. So we really care about that. That's one of the ways we're addressing uh, some of the misconceptions that we see out there around data science. Um, the other one of my favorite is if you have a business problem, you could solve it if only you could throw data science at it. 
And that's sometimes true. <laughs> sometimes you can throw data science at a problem and it will magically fix everything. But data science can provide the answers, but it rarely provides the, uh, the action. Like it might give you insights into the action, but people make data science work. Data science doesn't magically solve problems. Like data science can point to solutions that people can then um, act on and initiate. And of course, platforms like Domo and AWS and others can help help with that process. But people really are the magic here. Um, you can't make data science actionable without the people who are creatively coming up with solutions that use the data science well. Absolutely. It's just great points. And it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like you're dealing with this chaos of data, but you're also told that, you know, data science and analytics and insights that come out of it, it's like the answer to everything. And you've got, a, you know, a variety of tools and ideas about the talent. But Sean, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, you're kind of sitting in the middle of this and trying to sort it out. Like, what's the story at um, Freddy's, you know, frozen custard and steak burgers? Like, how did you start thinking about this, getting prepared and really getting started to be successful with, with data science there? So, so we started on this journey with the, the idea of what Christy just laid out kind of already baked in. I'm kind of an old school computer nerd. So the idea of garbage in, garbage out, that's been around forever, right? And so as we went from just taking you know, weekly sales reports and getting more and more data in, that was always in the back of our minds. So our data journey started like almost probably anyone else's, right? Take what little you can have and just start growing it and growing it and and not even really doing much analytics so much as just presenting it, just saying like, here, these are what our sales were. And you know, that was a huge gain. Everyone loved that. Um, but as we grew the data, we knew we had high quality data. Um, and it was just that natural evolution over time to where we said, okay, now we have a lot of data. Now we have billions of rows of data. Now it's high quality data. Now let's let's see what we can find out. What are those insights that are hiding out there from us? Um, and, and we we took different approaches. You know, we started with just a pure services mindset. We you know we said, hey, I'm not a data scientist. I don't have a, a PhD behind my name. Um, and again, just a, a computer nerd at heart. So we said, let's throw money at somebody else and let them do the heavy lifting for us. And what we found was another thing that Christy spoke to is that these data scientists for hire in this situation, they were too far removed from the people. They were too far removed from the true business questions and business insights. So that when we gave them our data, we gave them everything you need to get insights. You know, the insights that they were coming back with were things like, stores that are open will make more money than stores that are closed. I mean, just real heavy hitting type of information there. Um, and so we took that not to be discouraged by it, but to say, okay, maybe that quality of data that we had wasn't as good as we thought. Um, and maybe we need to bring that analytics and the machine learning stuff, we need to bring it closer to home. Um, now, granted, I'm not you know, in the restaurants serving our guests like our ops teams are, but I, I eat enough of our food, I go to our restaurants enough, and I work with those people enough that we were able to say, let's, let's take the insights that we know, even just from the, the support side, and then let's get in there and let's see what kind of you know, data we can, we can suss out. And then we were also going back to the basics on the business questions, the same things we were asking, we were just trying to present a simple dashboard of sales. What is it that you wanna know? You know? We were asking, what is it we wanted to know out of the machine learning? Um, keeping it simple. We wanted to know which restaurants compared to each other. And by, you know, having clear focus, by bringing it closer together, bringing it, you know, playing those cards closer to our chest, then we were able to actually get good insight, good data, good information, good usable tools that, you know, our research and development team, you know, puts to use on a regular basis. Our marketing team takes that and puts that to use on a regular basis. So our, our, our journey was, uh, for somebody who likes to just go fast and break stuff, definitely was slower than I'd like, but it was really at the exact right speed we needed to be. You mentioned something in this journey that was really interesting that you kind of have to step out of the technical box a little bit 
to really experience what it is you're going to try to change or improve. In your case, going to the restaurant, seeing how the restaurants operate, understanding what customers experience, understanding what could go right, what could go wrong. And it's almost creating this domain of information that you can start thinking about putting together for, for data science. I think that's a really important aspect of this. There is the softer side to data science, not just the tech. Um, Bob, <laughs> so I'm going to turn to you on the tech side, though, <laughs> you still need the tech, like how, how do you get started? I mean, you know, Amazon's got, you know, sort of this zoo of services and capabilities, like where, where do you kind of start pulling these things together to, to make it possible and get to the point where you can move quickly and break things at some point? Yeah, I'm going to play off a little bit of what both Sean and Chrissy said. A lot of times our customers come to us and they say, we love the platform, we love the services, we have the data. And a lot of the first questions we'll ask is, what are the key business problems you're trying to solve? And do you have a business sponsor that can sponsor your initiative to ask those tough questions? Are you driving revenue growth in the case? Or are you trying to do fraud analysis? And what are you trying exactly to do? And then what's your data strategy to, to play off of what Chrissy said? Do you have the right data? Is it accessible? Um, by whom is it accessible? And can you unlock it into your platform? And then of course, our solution architects will work with our customers on, on the, the technical architecture, but it really starts with exploring on what are the use cases, what are the business strategies, let's say, um, getting that sponsor, what are the business use cases, and then ensuring that that architecture supports all of that. Um, that ensures that as you head on this journey, and, and it is not always a fast journey, um, as you head on that journey, you have that continued sponsorship and you start delivering results. Um, and sometimes it's easy wins. Doing an automated contract review process might build up credibility for the machine learning team and that executive sponsorship versus a worldwide forecasting system that pulls from multiple different factors, right? And so a lot of times we'll work with our customers to balance the risk reward and the feasibility to achieve those early wins, build that credibility and get the uh, initial momentum moving. Does that make sense? That really makes sense. I think, you know, you're bringing up a really good point in terms of the fact that, you know, you might have this aspiration for global forecasting, but that means you got to push everything together. And uh oh, that means, you know, how do I build a warehouse and what is my MDM strategy and do I have the right catalog and what is my semantic layer and that you just get bogged down in the data and the technology without actually getting to the point of like, what was really the question I wanted answered? And to, you know, to say, you could start with forecasting in a very small area of your business. You could just say, how are my burgers doing? Or a very particular burger and, and, and get that moving along, absolutely. So Christy, kind of building upon that, I mean, part of getting started is, you know, you know knowing that you've got the right talent and that the, the ideas and the capabilities are really kind of facilitating you on this journey, can you help us understand a little bit like where where and how do, do you get started and how do you align your people process and technology so that you kind of defriction this a little bit and you get to those quick wins? I think that's such an important question and I hope that everyone can comment on it because there's, there's a lot of different answers to this question. <laughs> so. Uh, so to me, when, when I look at it, and if you had asked me this five to 10 years ago, I would have had very, very different answers. The technology has come along so far, and I don't think we can downplay the technology here because the technology makes some repetitive reporting types of tasks so much easier today. And so people who might be in traditional analyst roles today, they can do more. They can actually sit back and ask more interesting questions. They're not just throwing reports together anymore. 
they can ask more interesting questions. As long as they can get their hands on some data, that curiosity can drive them in really interesting ways. And they don't have to be a PhD data scientist to put together some really interesting, meaningful work. But if you pair them with a PhD data scientist, it, you know, it's, it's analytics on steroids and they can do a lot. Uh, so I think that it's really important for, for uh, companies who are anticipating embracing data science and everybody's going this way, right? Everybody's going to embrace it at some point. So, so if they're developing a strategy already, they probably already have analytics. Use what you've got, like build on what you've already got. Use the talent that's already there. Um, you already have some knowledge. You've got really, really deep business knowledge. So utilize all of that and make sure those people aren't lost in the shuffle. Um, get a leader in place that can direct those questions and pair mathematics and really good business questions together in meaningful ways. And if that means you get a consultancy, great. If that means you do an external hire, great. If that means you up-level somebody you've already got, great. But those are, I think, two of the areas that are really going to have to work together in the future. And then of course, you're going to have to adopt technology that works for your business and allows everybody to make the most of their jobs um, yeah. where they're going. Absolutely. So Sean, you know, let's pick up on the talent portion of this a little bit like what you know what type of data scientists do you need what did you what did freddy's need for for example like did you have that capability in house did you have to seek it out how do you kind of grow that competency and and you know do you really have to have the hardcore data scientists or can you have the citizen data scientists right. these days so um we've really taken a hybrid approach we are we're trying to do a lot in-house with our with People like me, I, I view myself as that citizen data scientist, but I, I look at, you know, my team, you know, we have those that are just, you know, fresh out of college. We have um, people that, you know, are really, their primary hat is in another sector of the business, whether it's research and development or real estate, but, you know, behind the scenes, they're wearing a data scientist lab coat, even if they don't know it. Um, so that part of our core team is absolutely there. Um, but we've leaned on, you know, Domo services, we've leaned on third party services to, to help, you know, at, at the very least, you know, check the math, check the, check the work, you know, mentally, I, I think of it like, uh, you know, when you say data scientist, you know, again, that lab coat picture, you know, it's one thing to sit there and come up with a great hypothesis and go and start the experiments and testing. But sometimes you just, you need a lot of people to, you know, fill up those test tubes and run those tests and, somebody to look at that, you know, um, I, I'm sure when Christy got her PhD, you know, she had somebody going over her numbers and saying like, well, are you, did you go this way, go that way. Um, and so having that, you know, some kind of outside resource that you can lean on is absolutely huge. And then that also comes into play on the tech side. You know, we're, I, I love the fact that we have Domo. It's great for everything we do. And it's, that's the technology piece that I don't have to worry about as an IT director. I'm not stressing out about, how exactly I'm going to connect, you know, to AWS. The work work is done for me, and that leaves me more time to be in that sponsorship role, or you know, checking the math role, or doing any anything like that. We just we don't have time to do just one thing. We have many many hats that we're putting on, um, and allowing us to be those citizen data scientists along with everything else we're doing. When you start to pull away some of the barriers around the technology or some of the deep details of like, what do you really have to know when you open up an algorithm and figure out how to use it? Like, I'm just, you know, that's usually the scary part when you say data scientist at first, but I'm curious, like, you know, Sean, did you find that when you can strip that away, you actually move faster in your competency, you drive more curiosity, you drive more creativity? in terms of what data science scientists can do. You absolutely can. Now, I, I will say I'm wary of, again, going back to garbage in, garbage out. I was wary about you know throwing in data into models and making sure that I wasn't falling into all these traps that like, I mean, you can search the web and find hundreds of articles of, of really smart people you know, doing figure wags, make sure you don't overfit your models and things like this. And, beware of such and such an algorithm. And like, I, I want to be true to that, but at the same time, by knowing the business and knowing some expected results, I can also judge those by what we know to be true. Um, and there's a lot to be said to that side of things. I know our Freddie's performance indicators, our FPIs well, 
And so when the data goes in, data comes out and these things match what we know to be true, then we can say, ah, yes, we can put that. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, the, the resources are there. Google is sitting right there. AWS is sitting right there. I can take something and go, I really feel like we should learn more about this before we say, yeah. you know, somebody's going to get fired based off of these data points. We really should make yeah. sure we know what we're talking about here. Exactly. I know that there was a question from the um, audience around like, what is a data scientist, a citizen data scientist? I hear like a lot of different things like, Sean, maybe just give me a quick answer on, on that. But I'd also love to hear from Bob and Christy about how they see and, and define a citizen data scientist. So when, when I keep using that term in my head, it's somebody who is not classically trained. Um, think of it like somebody who's really good at YMCA pickup basketball, but never played in college, never played in pros. They can get the ball in the hoop and they're gonna go out there and have fun, see results, lose some weight, but they, they're not going <laughs> pro anytime soon. And that's me. I love that, that's great. Bob, you wanna pick that up? What, what do you think a, a citizen data scientist is? And, and what do you think some of the, the, the skills and, and knowledge that they need to actually, you know, start contributing and contributing quickly and getting competent? Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do the basketball analogy. I'm not a good basketball player. But uh, <laughs> a lot of our customers come to us. They say we've got some machine learning scientists. They're doing great work. But now we've got our biz ops people or our finance people that also want to participate in the value of machine learning. And so when I hear citizen data scientists, it's usually associated with a business analyst or a sales ops person. And I, I think one of the Freddie examples early on that was mentioned, Sean mentioned, is like, look, we know our data and we know our business. And so we've been presenting data, but now we want to evolve beyond just basic analytics and use machine learning. And as the technology has advanced and we have auto ML type capabilities and we have firms like Domo helping, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more accessible. Um, I can visualize my data. I can take a look and see what are the features that may influence a model. Um, I could even have models developed for me and then look at them and see, based on my business knowledge, um, again, what intuitively makes sense. And yes, this resonates. It's accurate. It's much better than my Excel spreadsheet that I used you know, two quarters ago. And so it's, it's really... Uh, the citizen data scientist, it's all about the evolving of the technology to make machine learning, you know, more accessible to folks that are not classically trained. And then that's what yeah. we're seeing in our customers and we're seeing it more and more. Accessibility is such a critical piece of the puzzle here. It's, you know, rather than putting, you know, this, this big, you know, crystal palace at the top of your business and locking away this great talent, it's like everybody should be able to get to these insights and drive things forward. Christy, you know, I'm curious from, from your perspective, like how, how, you know, what do you, how would you describe a citizen data scientist first? And maybe the other side of it is not only because you're enabling them at Domo to, and, and really democratizing da uh, data scientists um, capabilities but, and talent, but should hardcore data scientists be worried? <laughs> All great questions. Um, I, to me, a citizen data scientist is someone we've mentioned not classically trained, but that could be a whole bunch of different things, right? Um, I think it's at the core somebody who's interested in data, uh, somebody who understands data and understands the usefulness of it. And with that, and especially with people, be, uh, more tools being at people's fingertips where they can manipulate their data in more interesting ways um, and do more interesting analyses with their data. Um, your citizen data scientists could be anybody from, I'm interested in data right up to that classically trained person, right? And the key difference I think between a classically trained data scientist versus not is the ability to pair data structures and, uh, and just the way data is put together and engineered with algorithms that match a business problem. Um, and, and that's the hardest thing that data scientists do is, is deal with all of those three steps. You've got a business problem, you've got algorithms and you've got data that all have to match and line up. 
And uh, if, if you know how to do that and you have a portfolio of work that shows that you can do that effectively, you're a data scientist in my mind. Um, if you don't, um, you're a citizen data scientist. And that could range, you know, that's a really, really big range. And we've got a lot of citizen data scientists making great progress in the analytics space and even in the data science space. And I, I think that I, I'm interested in Sean's journey too, because <laughs> most of the customers that we work with, when we take those citizen data scientists and work with them, the thing that's the most surprising is the data preparation. It's, it's not the algorithm. The algorithm is not the super surprising part. I mean, it's the one that everybody thinks about. Oh, data scientists do algorithms. We do fancy math. You know, that's why you hire a data scientist. But it's really this data prep piece. And citizen data scientists can save your company hours and hours and hours um, by, by knowing how to architect data and by knowing how data scientists ultimately think about that data and building data pipelines that really, really work. And that, that can save your company many, many, many millions of dollars in, in the long run of figuring that out and, and orchestrating that. And so I see that that is really where citizen data scientists can shine as they become more adept and they move more into that data science space in the future. I think they're all headed there. They, they love it. And they're people who are curious about data and they like math. So, so I think that that's where they're going. <laughs> So data, math, be, it's be worried. So cool. I think that they should, but what they can do to mitigate that is really learn how to work with, with BI. Um, data science and BI should not operate in silos. They should be working together and, and building each other up and making the organization really works well. There, I don't think there are a lot of technology pieces that are really great at that yet. Demos in the game. Like that's one of the things <laughs> we're really trying to do by putting all of the data in one place so everyone can see it. But uh, data scientists and, and, and analysts need to collaborate far, far, far more often than they do now in the future. Uh, absolutely. You know, you, you, you brought up sort of an interesting point there because you're, you're all illustrating there's sort of a team sport aspect to this. You have to collaborate. And, but collaboration can be kind of interesting because there's various stages of going from the data to kind of releasing those models in the wild to, watching how they're performing. Sean, can you give us a little bit of a perspective maybe about, you know, what, what happens at Freddy's to not only just work with the data and prepare that and what collaboration looks like there to getting to the point where you've got a great model, but how do you even get that model into your, your production systems and, and start getting the value out of it? That, that's a hard piece and you've got to bring in the right teams. What does that team look like and how does that team change and evolve? So it, it, it was hard, it is hard, um, and it is absolutely a, a team of teams approach. Um, you know, that, you know, making custard like that is not easy. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it tastes great. And when you get that, you know, those bites in from first to last, they're fantastic. But there, there's a shocking amount of data that goes into, into that. Um, and so, yes, we, you know, we have to have, um, you know, people that can look at point of sale data and make sure that that's coming in and, and is structured right. So, um, you know, my, my amazing point of sale engineers, you know, starts there with that data so that we get good data coming out of our restaurants, you know, every single day. Um, and then from there, it's working with our operations teams and understanding what it is that they need to, to drive and keep our restaurants running efficiently and serving our guests. And then it's their multi-unit manager support above them and finding out what is it that data that they need and how they look at that, that helps them drive those teams that are actually running the restaurants, the executive teams that oversee that, the finance teams that make sure everything behind the scenes financially is flowing, the construction team that is building that restaurant, the real estate team that's finding the restaurant, the training team that is making sure all the team members that we have across the country know how to make custard that looks like that. It's not just a promo shot. It's what you can get when you walk into and say, I want a turtle Sunday. Um, you know, training team and training needs data and they need their training platforms to bring data. Um, and then you have our franchise business coaches that go from anywhere from, you know, Tupelo, Mississippi, all the way up to Broomall, Pennsylvania and out to Utah. And they're the ones helping and making sure our, not only our corporate owned restaurants, but our franchise owned restaurants. Again, making that custard look like that. Um, 
and knowing what data they need to see, not whether it's just health inspection scores, but just the, the fretification of those restaurants. Are they like the ones here in Wichita, Kansas? And they are because we have great teams that do that. And they know that because of the data. So we're taking all of that data. I know I'm even forgetting teams, you know, our marketing team left them out. Sorry, marketing, please don't hate me. <laughs> um, you know, all, all of these teams, we're bringing all of this data together making sure that we're listening to them, listening to their hypothesis, listening to what they need to see, and then asking them questions and them asking us questions. And can we do this? Can we see that? Does this um, Waze campaign influence this and that? And, and sometimes it does feel like you're just taking all of this and you're throwing it in a giant tumbler, rolling it around until these beautiful shiny rocks come out. Um, but those rocks are, you know, billions of rows of, of data. So once you have that, um, now you're already naturally working. You've already broken down those silos because um, you're talking to the actual people that need the information, that are gathering the information in their, you know, line of business applications. And then we take all of that and then we can say, okay, I see what this looks like and I can see what they want to know. And I've talked to them and I've worked with them long enough to be able to say, I bet they want to be able to see labor retention. We're coming up to summer. It's it's going to get busy, and especially with you know the vaccine trends in this country going the way they are, we're hoping to see every restaurant get really busy. Um, and so we know that there there's hiring that needs to happen. Um, and in our in a regular year, and that would be right now, our multi-unit managers would be talking to the restaurants about that. Uh, but taking that labor data, who's been around, you know, how long? Hey, the, this team member looks like they've been there for four years. Are they a high school student that's about to graduate in May? You should probably have their replacement hired last week. You know, that's the type of stuff that is meaningful to them. You know, Domo gives us that accessibility tool to put that out in front of them. But it was all that work behind the scenes to get it to them so that then they can take it, have their time, digest it, act upon it get that person hired, trained, and again, right back to the custard. That's what's being made in June, July, and August over summer vacation. So it all, you just bring it all together and you make it work. So I have to say, you brought my favorite things together, data, math, and ice cream. So yeah. I'm definitely frozen gonna custard. find a Freddy's. Yeah, and frozen custard. Well, Thank you. <laughs> go check that out. Um, so, uh, Bob and Christy, I think, you know, what, what sort of goes into this, though, is when you've got this team of teams that's being described, how do you enable that? Like, what, what are really the key capabilities? How do you create um, workbenches that people can, you know, kind of collaborate on and see and share and do the same things? Bob, do you want to start with that? And then, Christy, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I'll start off. So I think I think it's there's no silver bullet here. Being very candid, I think it's a combination of people, processes, and technology. And it's it's really we see companies that will get their first machine learning initiative up and running in a certain division in a certain part of the country, maybe. And the real question is, how do you drive innovation across the whole company? And how do you share everything from the data, whether it be feature stores, and I'm digging into the technology or notebooks via a common platform, or even processes. And, and I've seen some companies set up centers of excellence in order to formalize a program office that can be a best practice of sharing. So when you have a, a model running in Texas, the team in Richmond, Virginia knows, hey, they're doing a, something very similar. How do we get access to that notebook? How do we get access to the features, the feature store, the data, et cetera? And so I really think it's got to be tops down leadership driving that innovation. It's got to be setting up the processes, but it's also got to be the tools that undermine it, that allow the, the workbench to flow. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over from there. Christy? Yeah. Christy? Well, I hope this answer isn't too esoteric. Uh, it's kind of pie in the sky, but I, I'm with Bob. I, I feel like a lot of this is more art than it is science. And it very much has to do with individual um, company culture and attitudes that surround that. But absolutely at the core of it is collaboration and the ability to celebrate wins as a team and to strive for one goal. I see data science teams and BI teams too um, fall short when they are asked a different question to answer every day. If you give 
people a million questions, they will answer them, but they will never answer them well. If you give talented groups kind of a North Star to point to, um, you know, our company is working on X. We really want to see everything that you can have around X. If you've hired talented people um, and you give them a checklist, they're going to check off the list. If you hire a talented group of people and you give them a vision, they're going to do everything that they can to motivate that vision. And they'll come up with things that you never thought of um, or, or ever dreamed of and everybody's got different talents. And so it's really, I think, trying to cultivate that teamwork and that synergy around one question that people in the organization feel like they can dive really deep on and not saturating them with too many questions at one time. <laughs> Your data scientist does not Google search. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually kind of move into some of the audience questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to just open up and type them into your chat. They will get presented to us and I will, you know, field them out to our panel of experts here. So, you know, take a chance. No question is um, a bad question. Every question is a great question. So whatever you think of, bring it out there. We're, we're ready to take it on. Um, in, in the meantime, I think, you know, you, every, we're talking about like all the journeys and the talents and the things that we've been able to accomplish, but not everything comes up roses. So Sean, how do you, you know, what's happened where you said, is my turtle Sunday going to melt? You know, the, to, to me, the, the, the things that cause the, the, the things where we're not coming up roses are, are when we kind of run before we really plan. Um, and, and that's the type of stuff that, that really will throw us off. That's the type of stuff that, you know, brings a, a kitchen down to its knees. And it's just that, that lack of planning. Um, and thankfully, that's like a truism for so much other stuff in business that it, it naturally falls into everything else we're doing. Okay. Fantastic. So one of the questions here is, um, how did you uh, how did you first best describe the benefits of machine learning to your team and boss? Sean, you wanna so, so what we did is, is is I just presented, you know, th this idea of again talking to all those teams of saying this is what everyone wants to know. We you know lots of people want to know how does a restaurant A compare to a restaurant B? So that if we're gonna test something, look at something, do anything, how can we compare? And I was able to say, you know, all this, and I put out all the different ways we looked at it and said, look at how long it would take for us to do this on a regular basis. Or we could throw it into machine learning. I think these, you know, algorithms will match up because they're designed for this kind of, of comparison and contrasting. And I think we can use that on a regular basis. So I just put it in, in real terms, and that's what clicked, and that's what opened up the purse strings for us to, to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, and, I've, and real quick, I've seen for some of our customers, they come and they say, we hear this thing called machine learning, we want to learn more. Um, and and to, to tie off a little bit of what Sean said, machine learning is great when there's a ton of data that's beyond the human capability to digest it easily. So for example, tens of thousands of consumers providing uh, reviews on a website, right? How do you use machine learning to do sentiment analysis to say, hey, Bob's hotel is known for their spa, maybe, and Christie's hotel is known for the restaurant. And how do you amplify those in future promotions? And so when we talk in those terms, people understand, okay, now I understand there's so much data and, and a human can't process it. And it could be something from simple to that, um, to other things that we see, uh, automated contract review, stop double typing all of that into an Excel spreadsheet when you can automate it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Christy, there's a, a few questions here and they kind of all resolve around, well, how does Domo help me? But maybe a little bit of context around that is, you know, questions about when do you just do simple, you know, traditional analytics and when do you start turning to to uh, data scientists, data science, or you know, machine learning algorithms, and and also like, how do you start to make the switch between running your analytics in something like a spreadsheet to 
starting to do it in, in a scaled out platform so that you're really getting to those insights quickly and at scale. Yep. Yeah, I, I feel like if you're doing analytics in in a, a Excel spreadsheet, you should immediately switch now. Um, <laughs> there's, there's going to be too much data in the future to manage that in any scale, and there are far too there are too many really really good platforms, be a demo or others or wh wherever you want to go, that can manage that and do it in a way that's just so much easier and saves everyone a lot of headaches. So if you're doing things in spreadsheets, I, I think that now's the time. Um, in terms of how do you transition from being an analytics shop to a more predictive shop, I, I think that if you, you know that you're ready, if you feel like your analytics are solid and good and you can trust them. If they are automated, solid, good, and you have 100% trust in them, you're ready to move to the next step. Um, you're, you're absolutely ready. Don't even hesitate. Don't hesitate moving to the next step. But then also, as you embrace data science, as I'm sure many of our customers and possibly even Sean could attest, um, data science clean is not the same as analytics clean. So the data scientists are going to take your great, wonderful analytics data and poke as many holes in it as they possibly can. And you're going to learn more about your data than you ever, ever wanted to know. And it's going to evolve the way that you do analytics as well, especially if you're doing it right. Um, so I think that that's how you know when to get started. And if you feel like your data scientists or the people that you are working with to do the data science have poked a bunch of holes in your data, that is exactly what it should feel like. You are on exactly the right path because you're going to transform the way everything around math and data happens in your organization when you go down that path. Absolutely. So Bob, um, a question for you, and, and it really gets down to, you know, it's it's all about getting access to the data and connecting that data in. Like, how do you go about doing that? How do you know what to pick and choose? What's the easiest? Do you, uh, Christy said you don't have to have everything. You didn't say you didn't have to have everything. Help understand, like, how do you start pipelining that in? How do you start connecting to it? What's the thought process and the enablement that you want to put behind that? Yeah, so a lot of it starts with a, a business analyst type mindset. You know, what are the problems you're trying to solve? And what is the data that would that you think will help you solve that? And then also, where is it stored? How frequently it comes in? And, and tying off a little bit of what was just said, how clean is your data? I mean, your data right. has to be significantly better here. And then once, once you have figured that out, you start running your machine, you start trying and experimenting. And through that experimentation and innovating, um, you're going to start seeing trends and patterns and you'll all of a sudden realize, wait a second, I didn't think about this. Let me try this. And your machine learning models will start coming out with whether it be a recommendation engine, next best, or, you know, what days uh, custard, uh, as I see somebody asked, you know, based on what other patterns, <laughs> what, when should you start selling custard, right? Um, and so a lot of it, a lot of our customers, their machine learning journey actually starts working with Domo to say, I don't have a good data strategy, or I thought I did, and I don't now. I'm realizing now. So how do I centralize it, make it accessible, uh, make it consistent format, and then going from there. Awesome. And then Sean, you know, one of the questions was coming in around training and talent. How do you how do you get that? Um, talent? How do you grow up that talent? How do you bring in those skills? Um, how, how do you, not just from a hiring perspective, but how do you even get trained? And, and I guess the second part of that it, it, that's coming through is how has working on Domo helped to facilitate that? And do you have an, an example of where that starts to come together? So I, I'm, I, I said earlier, I'm a big IT nerd. I, I should qualify that. I'm just a huge nerd in general. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I live and die by that old, uh, old Star Trek II phrase, you know, we learn by doing. Um, and so when we've brought on people, we brought on people that are curious. The curiosity to me is way more important than if they that if they know SQL well and, and what their experience is. Because I can take curiosity and, and, and we can mold it and grow it and shape it into what we want. So from the talent side, I'm okay with somebody coming in that's green. Now, granted, if, if you know somebody slips me a resume with a PhD on it and they're ready to go, and they're also curious. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to throw that out just because they're experienced. But um, that curiosity is is what's really important because the curiosity is what leads us to interesting questions. It leads us, you know, somebody was asking about, you know, favorite menu items. 
you know, it's easy for us to, to look at, and we know what Chrissy was saying. We know our analytics are good. I can tell you what our most popular items are. It's a number one, of course, that's why it's number one. Um, but the real deep questions are, what, what are our opportunities to promote things like the patty melt? They're delicious, but not enough people order it, but it's really good. You should order it. Um, and that's where we can, there's so much factors out there, so much data that that's where, that's the difference between machine learning and, and that, that kind of data science versus just analytics of just saying, yes, number one, 80, 20 rule Pareto principle, blah, blah, blah. Um, when can we really push that patty melt? How do we push that patty melt and get people doing that and increasing the craveability of our brand? Fantastic. So we have made it to the top of the 45 minutes of our panel conversation. I had a great time. I learned so much from everybody. I hope our, our uh, audience has too. We had great questions. I thought the conversation was fabulous. So, um, you know, look forward to uh, seeing and talking to you more on social media and certainly follow up with everybody afterwards if you have, you know, further questions or want to know more. This has been great. Have a great rest of the afternoon, everyone.